that emptiness can only be satisfied with the blessing of you. We need the blessing of you, God. Man. Jeez. Y'all put your hands together and bless the name of the Lord this morning. And just go ahead and look to heaven and say, God, we need you. We need you. We need you. We need the blessing of you, God. We need the blessing of you, God. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody shout amen as you take a seat. Amen. Thank God for our praise team and our band this morning. We appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your devotion. Um, and for leading us in songs this morning. One of the people we don't, you know, we always say thank you to the praise team, the band, and Jermaine Morgan sits in the back. Shout out to J-Boy on the ones and twos in the back. And then it's usually GB up here every week. You got on GB up here today. He got his handy dandy sidekick, partner in crime, Miss Kira Rutledge, controlling the video this morning. This is, this is our last Sunday on Regeneration. Minister Shakina mentioned it earlier when she was doing the exhortation about our study on regeneration. And then we'll finish off this Wednesday night uh, via Zoom, Bible study via Zoom. If you have not been on Bible study via Zoom, I encourage you all to join in 7 o'clock Wednesday night, one hour, um, as we kind of go into more detail, detail that we can't necessarily go over on Sunday morning. Uh, but regeneration, the new birth, being born again. I hear y'all back there. Y'all stop now, run. Stop, run now. We're going to have the whole church crowned in a minute. <laughs> Something about when that thing just goes doom, doom. Uh, so the, a, a question that is often asked um, in relation to life and sin uh, that, that is kind of taboo is, is a person born inherently sinful? Can a person be born with same-sex attraction to one another? Uh, can a person be born dealing and wrestling with the sin that we face? And I think the Bible is clear on that question, uh, on the answer to that question. Unequivocally, we are born into sin, right? Born into sin, shaped in iniquity. And so whatever the sin that is manifested in the individual person is, there is one solution to it you must be born again. So whether or not you feel like you were born a certain way or not born a certain way, the solution is whether you're born a certain way or not, you must be born again. For those of us that deal with sin, raise your hand if you deal with it, okay, cool beans, you must be born again. Like that is the solution that the Bible prescribes in order for us to inherit the kingdom of God. And our central passage has been coming from uh, uh, John chapter 3 when Jesus has this encounter with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, a very religious guy who was very familiar with the law and keeping the commandments of God and giving and all other sorts of external, outward expressions of love to God, had a dilemma when he had a conversation with Jesus. And that dilemma was Jesus telling him that all of that outward stuff is good, but it's not good enough. All of the outward stuff that you're doing to demonstrate your love for me is great and dandy, but I must tell you something, Nicodemus, you're still missing something. You haven't been born again. You haven't experienced the new birth. And for those of us who sit in here and we have experienced the new birth, then kudos to us. But for those of us that have friends and loved ones who have not experienced the new birth, then we understand that our life is an example to others so that they can know what it's like to serve the God that we serve. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus at night, hidden away from everybody, and Nicodemus asks a question that plagues the world today. What must I do to enter into the kingdom of God? Must, what must I do to enter into eternal life? And Jesus didn't say all the stuff that you would think he would say. He answered them very precise and very clear. He said, Nicodemus, unless a man is born of, 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 of spirit and water, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about when Jesus says that, and, and de depending on your how you were brought up, how you were raised, you know, that that's, will kind of determine your thought process on the new birth of being born again or regeneration. There are some that teach regeneration is us cooperating with God in this grand plan that he has instituted. 
And, and, and I tried my best to reiterate to you all over and over again the last four weeks that regeneration is a total work of God. Can you all say that with me? A total work of God. That means outside of human cooperation. That means you didn't cooperate. You didn't cooperate with God. You didn't come together in partnership with God to come up with how you were going to get your life right. God, because of his love and his richness and mercy towards us, uh, uh, sent his son to die for us, therefore paving the way for him and, him and you or you and him to be in right relationship. And so it's a total work of God. Regeneration or this new birth, and when I say new birth, I'm talking about this act by which God imparts a new nature into us as believers. Or he imparts a spiritual newness into us as believers. And for many of us, we can't necessarily pinpoint exactly when or how it happened, but we know it happened. For, for, for those of you all that sit in here right now, you don't know exactly what you were feeling when you were born. Right? Now, if you talk to people like my, like my, like uh, Michelle, Michelle used to tell me stories like, Jay, when I was two years old, I, I know I got to, I just got to give you a shout out for that. But I, when I was two years old, I remember my dad holding me. He was like, Michelle, don't nobody remember nothing when they was two years old. No, I remember because when I was six months old, my mom was holding me like this. And I'm, Michelle, don't nobody remember anything when they were six months old. But uh, she did not. What I'm trying to say is, she did. When the new birth occurs in our lives as believers, there may not necessarily be a point of reference for us, but by faith we believe that something has happened because something had to happen in order for us to put our faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Jesus says, no man comes unto, no man comes unto me unless my father first does what? Draw him. Unless my father regenerates him. Unless my father sparks something inside of his spirit that makes him respond to the word of God. So there's something that takes place that might not necessarily be able to be explained in order for us to be prompted to accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. It's a total work of God. God did this. The fact that you walk with him is because of something he did and not something that you did. Now, as a result of what he did in you coming into fellowship with him, then there is something that you do. But you don't do it in order to become in fellowship with him. Jesus did all the work. And so on this past Wednesday, we talked about the necessity for regeneration, the necessity for the new birth, and why regeneration is absolutely necessary for you and I, or for anyone that wants to inherit the kingdom of God. And there are a couple of things that, well, a few things that we said on Wednesday, but I'll mention a couple of them. One, regeneration is necessary because the unregenerate person, the person that has not been born again, is spiritually dead. Somebody say spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Like spiritually dead is spiritually dead. That means you're dead man walking. You're walking physically alive, but spiritually you're disconnected from your holy God because you are spiritually dead if you have not been born again. This is what the scripture says. And you have been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. And you have been made what? Alive. You have been made what? Alive. You have been made to be alive again. I had a conversation with a guy in the barbershop about 10 years ago on this, on this word revival. And he said, revival isn't meant for believers. Revival is meant for unbelievers. I said, no, 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 no. Revival is meant for somebody that was once alive, that died, that needed to be revived again. And you see, humanity from the very beginning was alive with God in the garden, in the person of Adam and Eve. But because of Adam's sin, humanity did what? They died a spiritual death. And humanity has been in need of a revival since the time of the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. And so for those of us that are alive in Christ, we have been made alive in Christ. God resuscitated us. God saw us sinking and dead and sin. And he went and he put on his ER clothes and he brought us back to life. That is 
That is something that is powerful for you and I to understand that you are alive in Christ because he made you alive. You were on the ground, on the pavement, dead, suffering, dying, on your way out of here. And he came up with a plan to resuscitate you, to make you alive again. Adam and Eve knew what it was like to be alive and to be dead spiritually. You and I were born dead in our sins and our trespasses. We had no idea on what it was like to be alive until Christ made us alive. And Apostle Paul said, you have been made alive. Thank God for him making us alive, him restoring us again, him using his regenerative power to cause us to new life, to spring us to new life. And you have been made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of this air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among those who you were once also. Because of Adam's sin, and because we are, by nature, sons of Adam, we're born spiritually dead. That is why there has to be a new birth. Because you and I were born spiritually alienated from a holy God. I'm talking about the good people. Spiritually alienated from a holy God. The good babies. Spiritually alienated from a holy God in need of regeneration. That is why regeneration is necessary. Another reason regeneration is necessary it's because you are spiritually dead, you are incapable. Somebody say incapable. You are incapable of seeking God. The person who is spiritually dead is incapable of seeking God. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of man to see if there's anyone who understands, anyone who seeks God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Those who are spiritually dead are incapable of seeking God. Unregenerate men, and, and so what they tend to do, or what, what, what people tend to do is they replace God with religions and philosophies, and ideas, and studying, and creation, and the universe, and relationships, and books, and meditation, and yoga. And, and, and Paul says, listen, what, what essentially what we've done is we've created, we've replaced the creator with the created things. But that is because unregenerate men and women are incapable of seeking God. Period. Unregenerate, this is another reason why regeneration is necessary. Because an unregenerate person cannot receive spiritual truth. Now I said this on Wednesday night. The unregenerate person cannot receive or comprehend spiritual truth. For those of you all that have not been watched in the blood of Jesus Christ that are watching right now, I love you so much. Jesus loves you too. But if you have not accepted Christ, you can't understand spiritual truth. Amen. Doesn't that seem hard to say? Yeah. The Bible says it, so it should be easy for us to say. All right. All right. Those who have not been washed in the blood of the Lamb receive the power of God through, 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 through salvation in Jesus Christ, i.e. being born again, you can't understand spiritual truth. Uh, yeah, yes, I can, Pastor, because I meditate all the time and I'm at one with myself. <laughs> I'm at one with nature. Yes. Nature and I are one. <laughs> yeah. right. You keep believing in nature. It was created just like you. And it too must bow down to the master's power. Oh, no, man. That is above every name. So you keep worshiping and coming at one with it as opposed to coming at one with God. Though the unregenerate person cannot receive spiritual truth or comprehend spiritual truth. Jesus answered and said this to Nicodemus. 
He said, well, surely I say this to you, unless someone is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And on, on Wednesday night, we emphasize the fact that when Jesus says you cannot see the kingdom of God, we're not just talking about physical eyesight. When Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When Jesus said, unless a person is born again, he can't even comprehend the things of the kingdom. Like, you remember this passage of scripture that says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. He says, if you've not been born again, that is foreign to you. It's like speaking a foreign language. It's like going to China, listening to people for the first time, and you don't have a clue what's going on. If you've not been born again, if your eyes have not been spiritually open, talking kingdom won't make sense. That's why we can come to church week after week and a lot of people have not been born again, but they've been adopted into the Christian faith. They hear you preaching, but they can't comprehend nothing that you're saying. Ouch. A lot of Christians serving, preaching, pastoring, singing, dancing, shouting, not been born again. Not been born again. So when you say spiritual things to them, they leave. Because the unregenerate person cannot perceive or understand what spiritual truth. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you've been born again, unless you've been regenerated, you've been You've been granted membership, but you've not been re regenerated. <laughs> but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. This is what your Bible says. The natural man, the person that has not been born again, cannot receive the spiritual things of God. And in fact, he said they're foolishness to him. You ever talk to somebody about the Bible, and, and they just look at you like you just dumb in the face? They can't understand it. So then we look like idiots when we start arguing with people about something they can't even comprehend. And as opposed to arguing with people, we need to be praying that they, their, their eyes would be open to receive exactly what God has granted them access to. They must be, they must be born again. They must be regenerated. They must be made alive in Christ. And so here we are arguing with people over stuff. I had a conversation with somebody said, you know, a lot of people, they don't go to church, you know, because, you know, y'all Christians turn them away. Well, if they don't go to church because us Christians turn them away, then that's a problem for them. They must be born again. Well, you know, people that are leaving the church in droves, could it, be, could it be because of the music? Could it be because of the ambiance? Could it be because of the decor? No, it's because they are unregenerate. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create all of these external outward things in order to appease men whose hearts have not been transformed. And so we spend our whole budget on lights. We spent our whole budget on the women's ministry and the men's ministry to try to get people to feel good about themselves in church. They must be born again. And people that have been born again, you don't need to do all of the external stuff to make them feel welcome in the house of God. And so now we've watered down Christianity, we've watered down being born again, we've watered down what it means to be a follower of Christ for the sake of seeker friendly people. Jesus. We want people to feel good about their sin. Jesus. It's okay. Come here, let me give you a hug. Oh, Jesus. Let mama kiss you on the cheek. <laughs> oh! No! There's a way to love without condoning. Yeah, yeah. Right? There's a way to be there without being there judgmentally. Mm -hmm. There's a way to extend the love of Christ and uphold the standard of scripture. And what we do in many of our churches now is that we, we warded the whole thing down now. If the kids can't perform, then I just, I ain't, you know, I ain't coming. 
the fact that you call it a performance is a problem. And if we're training our kids to get up here and perform, then we're part of the problem. When they come up here, it is ministry. It is an act of service to God. And if that is not the case, then sit down somewhere anyway. Say it with me. You must be born again. I hope y'all are typing right now. I know it's tight, but it's right. You must be born again. When I first came to Redeemer like this, I used to preach. I don't mellow down a little bit now. <laughs> you, must, you must be born again. The unregenerate person then is under the power of Satan. Period. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That is what your Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. Even if our gospel is veiled, if it is hidden, if it's not comprehended, it's not comprehended by those who are perishing anyway. Ouch. Whose minds the gods of this age has blinded, who do not believe unless the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the image of God, should shine on them. I, Jesus, will deliver you from the Jewish people. This went to Paul, as well as the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness into light and the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus says, I'm sending, he's sending Paul, I'm sending Paul, I'm sending you to the people that want to kill you. I'm sending you to the people that can't stand you. Not to get them new likes and not to give them enough money so that they can do dinners for the men's and the women's ministry. But I'm sending you to people that want to kill you so that you can preach to them the truth of me so that they can repent of their sins and come to me because I've already knocked on their hearts. I've knocked on their hearts. I've been tugging at their hearts. I've been drawing them to me. Now I need you to go preach the unadulterated truth to them so that they can repent and be saved. Remember, you can't, you can't repent. You can't see God. You can't turn to God unless he draws you first. He said, I'm drawing them, Paul. Now you go preach that word. That's my encouragement to you all. God is drawing some of those people in your family, some of those people on your job, some of those people in your community. Now you go preach the unadulterated word of God Maybe not in the sense of me standing up with a microphone preaching in front of you like this, but you go talk that word of God to him. You go proclaim. That's what preaching is. You go proclaim with power that word of God. The unregenerate person is under the power of Satan, period. The person that has not received Christ as the person of the Lord and Savior is under the power of Satan, period. Now, because we're on social media, we have influence by, uh, with people that don't necessarily believe what we believe. So there are a lot of people that might watch our service and say, well, Pastor, I disagree. You can disagree, but my standard is not your standard. My standard is the Bible. My Bible says that those who do not believe in Jesus Christ are up under the power of Satan, period. So we can agree to disagree, but I'm right because the Bible is right. The unregenerate people, person, constantly dwell in darkness. John, uh, John chapter 1 verse 4 says this. In him, Jesus Christ was life, and the light was the light of men. Jesus was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. Jesus came and shined his light in darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. Why did the darkness not comprehend it? Because the darkness was unregenerated. All right? And this is condemnation then, therefore. That the light, Jesus, came into the world and men loved darkness more than they loved Jesus. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who practices evil hates Jesus. And does not come to Jesus. Because they don't want their deeds exposed. And then Romans says this as a result. They became futile in their mind and in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. And God gave them over to a reprobate and debased mind to do those things which were not fitting to God in the first place. It's almost like it's almost like when your parent, it's almost like when your parent tells you not to do something over and over again, and then they, you just keep doing it, and they just watch you touch the hot stove just just to watch your hand burn. Because I don't told you over and over and over again not to touch the stove. 
But your curiosity is making you want to touch that stove anyway. And so now I'm going to sit back and watch you touch the stove and burn your hand. But burning your hand might save you in the long run. Paul says God turns them over, unregenerate person. They're left to do essentially what their mind lets them do. So it should be no surprise to us when we look at the landscape of the world that we live in today, right? Like none of this stuff should be a surprise to any of us because this is the world doing what they're supposed to do and this is the book playing out exactly like it said it would play out. But the problem is not why we need regeneration because for those of us that sit in here today, I think we can come to the conclusion that there's a definite definite need for regeneration. There's a definite need to be born again. There's a definite need for us to be made spiritually alive in Christ. And so when we look at the nature of the new birth, when we look at what actually happens at the new birth, or, or what God is trying to produce in the new birth, I think that will help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of Jesus as we continue to carry on throughout, as we continue to carry out life. So we already said the new birth is the work of God. John 6, 6, uh, 6 verse 63 says this. It is the spirit that makes alive. Again, this is John 6, 63. It is the spirit that makes alive. Or in you know, more you know, antiquated translations, they would say quicken, quicken. You know? It is the spirit who makes alive. The flesh prophet is nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and so they are life. The flesh prophet is nothing. The Holy Spirit is life. But what gives life? The spirit, yes. But something in connection with the spirit produces life. And he says, it's the word. And so it is impossible for us to continue to experience the newness of life in Christ without the Word. So when I say the word. the word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the Word that I'm talking of? I'm talking of Jesus Christ. But to simply say Jesus Christ is the Word would do the entire scripture a disservice because there are a lot of people that say, well, if Jesus didn't say it, then I don't necessarily abide by it. Well, that's what the apostle said, but that ain't what Jesus said. Well, that's what Moses said, but that's not what Jesus said. When the Bible says in John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that means all of the word is Jesus. Like the Old Testament all the way up into Revelation is Jesus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Malachi, all the way up into it's Jesus. And so when we apply the word of God, the totality of the Bible, we apply Jesus to our lives. That's why it's important for us to really dig deep into God's word so that we can get an understanding of what he's trying to say to us so that we can live lives that are pleasing to him. But if we only negate certain parts or other parts, then we miss exactly what Jesus is saying. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we understand that the new birth is the work of God, that the word is necessary in order for us to comprehend what we call eternal life or spiritual life. Yeah. yeah. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus Christ to do good works. For God has ordained us, predestined us that we should walk with him. John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man is born again, natural birth, and of the spirit, spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The new birth then is God imparting his, his nature, his spirit inside of us. First, or second Peter chapter 1 says this, whereby are we given, whereby are given unto the succeeding and great and precious promises. That by these promises you might be partakers of the divine nature. For two years at this church, I preached about the about the uh, Apostle Paul and the struggle between the spirit man versus the uh, natural man. And so what Paul is what Peter is saying is that the moment we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, there is a new divine man that is at work in us, and they're constantly at war with the with the flesh man. And so when do we receive this? That is imparted to us at salvation. 
So when we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, God himself imparts a new nature in us. Which is why Paul would go on to say, any man that is in Christ is a what? A new new creature. New nature. He has something else at work in him now. He's not just living for the old nature anymore. The old man anymore. But there is a new nature at work in him now. And that, who he, that is who he must appease. The new nature. The divine nature. All right, one more, one more passage of scripture. I want to, I want to read this. Um, and this is, this, is, this is really what I was supposed to focus on today, but I, obviously I'm not going to focus on it now. Um, being born again, and I want you to hear me clearly with this. Being born again is not simply a religious experience. And, 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 and within the context of our churches today, that's, that's important for us to understand. Because we value experience more than truth. We value how we feel more than what God says. And so now what we've done is we are uh, dumbing down God's word to make us feel good with no regard to what he said. Amen. Because if we can make God agree with us, then it would be easier to serve him. Wow. It's easy to serve someone you are in agreement with. Why it's difficult to serve God is within our heart of hearts, we know he don't agree with what we agree with. He don't condone what we do. He don't like how we live. And so it's difficult to serve a God like that with, pure, with a pure heart. Until we yield to his will, we won't ever be able to serve him in the capacity that he desires. Because in the world that we live in today, we value how we feel in our experience more than what God says. Which is why someone can talk to you and say, or, or, or you can give instruction as as a shepherd, as a pastor, as a spiritual leader or under shepherd to flock, and they say, well, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't argue with people no more. Right? Once you tell me what the Holy Spirit did or did not say, <laughs> can't argue with people like that. But essentially what it is, is I value this feeling that I got. Like this, this whether it was in your bed, whether while you were praying, whatever the case was, it's this feeling that I just, it's this feeling. Pastor, oh, I just got this feeling that just came over me. and I, just, I, just, I don't care about the feeling. Not that I don't care about how you feel. I just don't care about how you, like, like, if it does not align with what we see in the scripture, Amen. I just don't, I don't, I don't care about how you feel. Amen. There are some people that believe whose theology does not line up with the scripture. And so for us, we have a responsibility to teach them what the scripture says so that their feelings can align with what God says. Point, in, point, point, an example. In Acts chapter 8. There's a guy by the name of Simon. This is what he says. Acts chapter 8. But there's a certain man, uh, beginning at verse 9. But there's a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city he used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great person. <laughs> Got people all fooled, doing sorcery and everything. 
Verse 13. Then Simon himself believed. Somebody say believe. believe. Simon himself believed. God used to practice sorcery. Now he believes. Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he believed and the man got baptized. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs that was being done. He practiced sorcery. He doesn't practice it anymore. He believes. Not only did he believe, he got baptized. Not only did he get baptized, he followed Philip, the person that was leading him spiritually. I look at this person because his feelings didn't align with the word of God. Verse 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying of the apostle's hand, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power that upon whoever I lay hands on, he might receive the Holy Ghost too. And Peter said to Simon, to hell with you and your money. That's the translation. I'm telling y'all, I promise you, that's what Peter was saying when he said it. I said it about four years ago here, and I stand by it now. Peter said to Simon, to hell with you and your money. This can't be bought. There are some people in some churches that think because they give a certain amount of money that they are get some special treatment. I wish they would. I'm going to tell them what Peter told Simon. Well, Pastor, I just feel like the cup. Peter didn't care about how Simon felt when he told Simon those words that he told him. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus is an all-loving God, all-caring God, all-compassionate God. Y'all ever read some of the stuff that Jesus said to some people? There are times when this man just did not care. Like, we, we mentioned on Wednesday that he told some people when he was preaching to them, like, hey, listen, Psst, FYI, you are of your father the devil. Or praising Peter in one instance and then Peter telling Jesus, no, 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 I'm not going to let you die. And then Jesus looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Right. Like there's an element to love that is hard sometimes. Oh, man. That, 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 that. There, there, there's an element to love that is blunt. I have no doubt that my mom loved me. But... That woman was blunt at times, a lot of times, most of the time. <laughs> it still doesn't date the love, though. And I think because we wore it down, going back to what I said in the beginning, then when we get tough with people, then they say, well, you don't love me, you don't care, and so we leave, and I'm saying, you have not been born again. Jesus, I'm praying. I'm praying. <laughs> Forgive us. Forgive us for being so soft. And so weak. Forgive us for being so timid. We're strong with everything else. We give everybody else a piece of our mind. We go hard for our jobs. We go hard for our families. We study for the bar. We study to get into college. We go hard for the ACT and the SATs. We go hard for everything else. Except for you. Forgive us.
forgive us. For those of us in here that have been washed in the blood, that have been born again, who have experienced a new birth, it doesn't mean that our outwardness changes, but it should. So help us to be more like you, Christ. Where we can put the love of Christ on display, but at the same time, where we can speak truth to a lying world. Dying world. Well, we cannot, well, we can tell the truth without trying to hurt people. But if we offend people, then we have the assurance of knowing that it's the word of God that does the piercing. So help us to preach the word of God. In season and out of season. When people want to hear it and when people don't want to hear it. Father, some of us will lose friendships over this gospel. Some of us will lose friendships over this gospel. Because they just simply can't handle it. Season our lips with grace. Make sure our hearts and our minds are pure so that we can love how you desire for us to love. Care how you desire for us to care. If there's anybody that's watching right now and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and he's been knocking at your heart, tugging at your heart, and you've not made the decision to follow him, today is the day of salvation. I bid you today to follow, to follow Jesus. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. Amen? Amen. 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 So as we close, I just want to piggyback off of what Pastor Jermaine was saying. For those that are listening online and have felt the tugging, have felt the piercing that this is the time to receive that salvation that he spoke of. So even from where you are, just lift your hands and say that you have accepted, that you are aware, that you acknowledge that Christ is your Lord and Savior so that you can be regenerated and know what we are talking about and experience what we are talking about because this side is only temporary. So to know what we are talking about and have that place with our Heavenly Father for eternity be regenerated today. Today is the day for salvation. So, also, this moment, is, this day is a day of tithes and offering. So please feel free to give via Cash App, PayPal, Easy Tide, or bringing in your check Monday through Sunday to the church. We welcome all forms of payment. Also, announcements. We do have our Mother's Day service coming up. We do prefer if you can come into the house of the Lord and worship with your moms, your grandmas, your aunties. And also, it's a day that we are going to remember mothers that are no longer here but still deserve to be celebrated. Saturdays, uh, Minister Sean is doing something for our youth. He is coming up with a very special curriculum for our teens, our young adults. So we stay tuned for what is going to come, and that will still be via Zoom every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. All right, and if we can stand for our benediction, we can close out. Let's beat the rain. <laughs> Make sure I don't have any other announcements. All right. Oh, yes, and Bible study. See, I know I was going to miss something. Bible study, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Every Wednesday via Zoom. Please tune in. What we get on Sunday, you have no idea what we get on Wednesdays. 
So come in for that unadulterated, unfiltered word of God. Wednesdays at 7 p.m. <laughs> All right, so, and now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God give you his peace in your going out and your coming in, and your lying down and your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears. Amen. Amen.